<laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, some of this talk will have certain overlaps with uh, Maximilian's much better talk this morning. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, geoparsing, um, specifically in the context for this gathering of ancient text, um, and about how we adapted a general purpose tool for ancient texts. And I'm also going to mention, because it may be of more general interest to some people, that there is an online service where you can do your own geoparsing. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about, very informally, about spatial networks. I'm not an expert on spatial networks, but I was asked to attempt it. Um, and um, yes, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so I, I will, you, you will see yet more uh, screenshots of GAPFIS. You've seen several already. And um, I will basically, that sums up how we are doing networks of spatial connection by textual code currents, as simple as that. So uh, just to explain what the GAP projects actually are, it's, um, they're um, funded by Google Digital Humanities uh, in 2010-11. And very kindly, the following year, they just said, would you like some more money? So we said yes. <laughs> it's not a difficult question to answer. Um, and the, the, the people on the first slide are those involved, um, Elton there, myself, Leif, Eric Kantzer and Nick Rabinovitz, um, who are from all sorts of different backgrounds. And it's a nice acronym because it's multi-purpose. It either means Google Ancient Places, if you're talking about the first year, or it means uh, the geographic annotation platform, if you're talking about now when we're trying to make it a bit more general. The gap vis utility, um, I'm going to come back to that in a bit more detail in the second half of the talk. And I haven't dared put any slides up about the gap in a box, which is in prototype at the moment. There is a website, but I'm not telling you where it is because we were told we might break it if too many people try using it. But the idea is that you can just point at a URL of your own, which contains a text that you want um, analysed. and it, chunters around for a little while, and then you get your text in GAPVIS. So, uh, Maximilian mentioned it's a pipeline system, the geoparser. This is my end of things, so, um, that I know best about. Uh, it was written by Claire Grover and Richard Tobin at Edinburgh, and it's basically a, a two-stage process. You do geotagging, which is named entity recognition specifically looking for mentions of places in free text. And having found all of those mentions, you then attempt to resolve them against um, a spatial location using a suitable gazetteer. And typically, you will get lots of candidates. You know, if you try and geo-resolve London, there are, I don't know how many hundred. Um, and it will then try and select the correct one for this particular context. And this system was, was designed around modern texts, so for ancient place names it had to be adapted. That was the, the sort of original interface that we used, and it's just to show you how the thing was designed. So you've got the text, the highlighted um, words are the, um, the, the tokens it has identified as um, probable place names, and on the right it's got uh, the list of all the candidates, which scrolls off the screen, and that's the one that it's picked as what it thinks is the relevant one in this context. And they're all plotted on the map because this was intended as a research system so you could see visually whether it had actually got the right one or one of the red ones should have been picked. Um, <laughs> this is a complete aside. Um, I, we, we, one of the things we very simply did was just take out all the red ones so that you just saw the, the green one, which is um, we weren't interested in as a research system. We were working on the assumption it produced good data and we just took the top ranked one. But I only put this in because I couldn't resist. Um, um, I'm a big Jane Austen fan. She died today. I couldn't not mark that um, anniversary. So I just uh, geoparsed a little bit of uh, text about her life from Wikipedia because uh, she did spend part of her life here three, three times. So getting back to uh, business. Um, 
I've mentioned that you need a suitable gazetteer, and as Elton said earlier, for ancient places, the suitable gazetteer is Pleiades. Um, and I think he's already said all of this. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about Pleiades Plus, which is um, in partnership with the Pleiades team, is our sort of enhanced version um, that we used uh, in GAP. Um, so one of the things that was done was, um, I think this was largely Elton, uh, went through Pleiades, matching it against GNAMES names and trying to find um, entries that corresponded to Pleiades entries. And that, in many cases, gave us extra data. Just you know, the most useful thing was extra place names that um, are references to actually what we think is the same place. And that can be very helpful because the text may refer to a place on many different names. Um, the other part of it happens at runtime, so that if, if you've identified in the text a token that you think is a place name but it's not in the Pleiades database, then we look in geonames for alternative names and throw them back at Pleiades. Um, Egypt is an example which is not in Pleiades, it has Egyptus and that in geonames lists that as one of the alternatives so we get back to from Egypt to Egyptus via the helpful little link of uh, geonames. Not without caveats, obviously, and it may lead you astray, but we found it actually more often produces good results than bad results, much more. Uh, another thing that we had to do in adapting the standard Geoparser pipeline was to tell it about ancient people, basically. Um, without going into a lot of detail, um, as well as the, the gazetteers, which um, I'm defining as lists of geolocated places. We also just have lists, lexicons of various categories of entity um, that we use to help disambiguate um, at the first geotagging step. And um, you get a lot of mints if, you've, um, if your text has things like Paris as being a, a name instead of a, a very common place. So basically, again, Quite, quite simple stuff. A lot of this project was done in quite small amounts of time. Uh, we simply dropped the modern lexicons and added um, some fairly cobbled together um, ancient personal name lexicons, which again made a huge difference to how well it worked. So um, that's, that was how we um, adapted the modern geoparser to, to work with ancient places. And we tested it on the HESTI data, which again, as Elton um, said, was had the big advantage that we got made, uh, marked up correct answers. And I can't off the top of my head remember what the results were, but it was in the 80%, so it was good. You know, that counts okay. Um, now I just want to mention some of the, um, uh, the other uses of the Geoparser. And if you want to use it yourself, the easiest interface is via Edina who um, have it as part of their unlock service. It's the unlock text part of it. Um, and it's a bit of a moving feast because we keep changing the geoparser and Edina curse us every time we do that. And uh, when they have a moment, they try to get round to updating the service to reflect the, uh, the latest <coughs> things that we've done to it. So if you want the absolute latest up-to-date version, then ask us and we'll give you a, a copy you can run locally yourself. But if you simply want something that's fairly quick and easy to use online, then um, Edina ma maintain this service and they are um, paid by JISC to maintain it as a service to uh, academics and anyone else. And uh, the way that works is you basically supply a URL for your input text. Um, you get quite a bundle, quite a complex bundle of output files that you can use um, however you like. You do not get any interface. Uh, you get the raw data that you can do what you want with. Um, there are some things that you can do that the documentation doesn't tell you about, and I've just put a link to a blog post of mine that um, explains some of them, particularly if you want to use the Pleiades Gazetteer. Uh, you'll need to read that blog post because the documentation on Edina's site doesn't yet tell you how. Um, that's just a list of um, some of the other projects that uh, where the Geoparser has been um, an integral part of it. Um, 
and I've sort of listed ones that are quite different genres. Um, and, you know, the Holy Grail would be something that just works <laughs> <laughs> on different text. <laughs> um, and we haven't achieved that. You, each time you have a completely different uh, genre, you do have to tweak the thing quite a lot. Um, so that seems to be life. I've highlighted uh, Deep, the English place names uh, survey. Um, interesting conversation with Humphrey about this just now. Um, so it's evidently not uh, completely uncontroversial how uh, this project. But uh, from our point of view, what we are doing is um, the, the whole of the multi-volume um, English place name survey is being digitised and into an OCR, and we are taking the OCR output, turning it into um, a database, basically, and pulling out the entries into um, uh, individual structured gazetteer entries um, that we are tying to the Adena Unlock gazetteer, which I think is based on the OS 50001, which, as we heard this morning, is hopefully going to be superseded by something new and uh, snazzier in the future, but that's what, it, what is available now. And that this gazetteer will be another one on the unlock service that Adina maintain. Um, and we've recently been working with um, people on the Spatial Humanities Project who um, are using this gazetteer. They, they've already um, built it into, into their work um, on Lake District uh, Diaries. <coughs> okay, so uh, now a bit about spatial networks. Says she, going a bit nervous because I don't know much about spatial networks. Um, so I'm going to start with the, inter the easy stuff and just tell you a bit about GAPFIS. I just wanted to start by making the point that I said Adina just give you the raw files and let you make what you want of them. And we've had some discussion about this this morning. Some people, well, you know, that's what they want. But there definitely are other people who want some sort of interface that they can actually just use without having to do a whole amount of work themselves. Um, and some of the applications that we're looking at um, in Hestia 2 are going to be experimenting with real students uh, actually using GAPFIS on real coursework um, to, to see, you know, what things work well and what things don't. It, it, it's always an issue though, you know, as soon as you build an interface you put your interpretation onto the data, so <coughs> obvious issues there. Um, now, you've already seen quite a few pictures of this, and I'm afraid there are a few more coming. Um, I thought I'd just start by just to allow you to visualise what's going on. So, uh, the original input was all Google Books. The first tranche of funding was to, to work with Google Books. So, we took those and uh, we munged them up so that they could be put into the Edinburgh Geoparser two-step process which we, in turn, as I explained, tied up with Pleiades. And the output of that was turned into um, a database that's got two purposes. Um, this was what Eric Cancer did. Um, ties you back to the original text snippets from the Google book, so you can get right back to the context of the book um, that you're reading. And it also... Um, enables you to do a bit of munging and counting and frequency analysis and all that sort of good stuff um, in order to draw some a nice visual interpretation of um, spatial networks. And you put that all together, you get GAPFIS. So in GAPFIS, there are three views. Apologies to anyone who's, a, who's used this, but this is for people who've never actually used it. It's basically got three, three views. You get the, the summary page, um, that gives you an overview of all the places mentioned. You've got the reading view, where you're um, designed for people who are actually reading the text page by page. And as you've got the, I'll come on to it in a minute, as you have the current page, it will show you context on a map. And then you can, the place detail lets you focus in on a particular place and look at these networks that we talked of. So that's an example of a book summary. Uh, this is Thucydides. History of Peloponnesian War, and I think um, Maximilian already basically went through all of this this morning. So on the on the right hand side, you've got the the frequency counts of all the places mentioned in the book, and the little bar chart things show you 
where in the book they're mentioned. So, you know, that's the whole book from beginning to end, page by page, and the big chart, me, uh, bigger bar means that it's been got several mentions at that point. Uh, the map obviously shows you the distribution, and there's just a little bit of text that tells you that there are 213, and these are the most frequent. Then you've got the, the reading view for going through it um, page by page, and here I just, this is page seven, uh, which has got Asia, Attica highlighted, Mycenae, and it must have is that Argus down, down below. Uh, over here we've got um, page seven uh, in the sort of timeline along the bottom, so you can see uh, what places are mentioned on each page. You can scroll back and forth. If you do that, as you do so, they fade in and out on the map, so you can see how the narrative is moving geographically. Um, and if you click on one of them, as I have on Attica, then it will just give you a little detail about it and show how that place is mentioned throughout the book. And then if you click on that for detail um, on Attica, in this case, um, it will do this little spatial network for you and tell you that it's there are 42 references to Attica, um, it gives you a few external resources about Attica, and it tells you in this particular text which are the, the top places that it is related to. So, related to, what do I actually mean by related to? We have a, a very simple algorithm, and I would argue that um, simple is good. Uh, <laughs> It's very easy to understand, and you can, um, you know, you can interpret to your, for yourself uh, how useful and valid you think it is. Um, it's simply we're simply looking at textual co-occurrence. If a place is mentioned with another place, we count out how, how often that happens, and build up a little um, uh, frequency distribution of how often a place is mentioned with the the top other places it's mentioned with. If that makes sense. So um, I'm just going to, to finish off with a, a few slides. As I said, I, <laughs> I think this is the third time I've said it. Um, I'm not an expert in this. Um, so here are a few slides that are just some thoughts intended to uh, stimulate cleverer people. Uh, <laughs> that I think there are some you know, issues around this. Um, Okay, so sometimes we find that places are, are mentioned along with places that they're near to, and maybe you would expect that. I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't. Um, if a place is mentioned with somewhere that's a long way away, does that automatically suggest some more interesting connection, political or military or trading or whatever? Um, I'd have thought yes, but it seems to me it's arguable at least, you know. Is that, is that obvious? Uh, and I'm just wondering to what extent can you do a systematic analysis of this kind of thing? It seems to me a potentially very difficult problem and I'm hoping somebody who knows a lot about network analysis will say no actually it's very simple. Um, and oh, I've just mentioned the, the issue of how to present it, so noise levels for low and high frequency places. Here's a low frequency place, um, the Mopoli. Only three references, and um, very, you know, quite a long list of related places. Quite a, a complicated-looking graph. But if you look at the numbers, they're, they're tiny. They're all ones. So whether you know whether that's valid, uh, very significant. It's difficult to say. Here we have Athens, which is obviously a high-frequency place. On the face of it, it's got a less complicated graph. When you just glance at that, you know, it's a smaller um, range. Um, but these top related places are enormous numbers and of course we've cut off the long tail, you know, a huge amount has just been taken out to make the thing simple because otherwise you'd get, a, you know, just a mess as, you know, you get a spaghetti uh, network as we heard earlier. And um, as I say, I, one of the approaches we're taking is to actually try it on students as a way of testing this. This seems to be a good approach if you not, um, I, I think it's very difficult to do a normative evaluation and actually testing it in the wild seems a good, a good approach. There's always the problem when you design an interface that that's what people see. They see your interpretation of the content, not the content itself. And I, again, I just wonder is, is there 
some way of getting a, a gold standard that we could evaluate against normatively to say that, you know, actually, in the way that we marked up the places, an expert marked up the places so we can test whether we find them, could we have an expert to mark up to say, well, these places are actually connected, see if you can find that automatically. But I don't know if that's possible. And I think that was everything. Perfectly on time, we go. Five minutes for discussion. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, we can start with lots of resources, but specifically, I'm intrigued by the use of the term the timeline of the pool. So we shall have a pool for the signal. There's a little bar there. And then that specifically just talks about basically which pages to put you in. You're, you're, not, you're not trying to kind of fix a start. Uh, I said I said timeline. Sorry, which was uh, it, it's it's using the simile timeline widget. It's a, yeah. What seems to be a very neat idea of Nix, but it, it is actually just pages. It's yeah. it's not but chronology at all. It's it's a, a only narrative chronology, as it were. It's just going through the book page by page. But it might be interesting in terms of the history. Presumably, someone could put a start date roughly when that book set. Well, according to Elton, that's probably not possible, at least for Herodotus, but that's well, a very interesting question. One thing that we're doing actually with uh, the, the user testing, the case you mentioned, is working with uh, Adam Rabinovitz, who is the brother of Nick Rabinovitz. Um, he is a professor of archaeology in Texas, in Austin, and he's, he's been working with uh, his, a couple of uh, Class, the graduate class, to kind of test scaffolds and break it and all different kinds of things. <laughs> and one thing he's particularly interested in is time. Yeah. So he, he has his own um, graphic visualization of data uh, It's called Geodia, yeah. G E O D I A. And he wants to try and match up Geodia and Gaffit and, and see what happens. Actually, try to introduce the idea of real time chronology into narrative and see if we can get that. Yeah, the is a particularly complicated, yeah. but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we'll we get. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, it's um, brilliant stuff, it really is. Um, it's something interesting, when you sort of feed the text into the this related against the uh, gather to place names, um, I presume this is only kind of English. So I'll see the possibility of feeding like Anglo Saxon charters into them and start picking up. If, if you have access to research funding, I think we'd be very interested <laughs> in doing other languages, but no, I'm afraid it's only English at the moment. Yeah, it's a rule based um, tagger so and it, it's heavily dependent on English language grammar rules. I think it's also, I presume, also like on the kind of like a text that you're using to feed in as well, depending on the kind of the translation when it was done as well. So yeah, that's very true. And, and to be honest, an even bigger problem is the fact that most of our texts are OCR output, and we didn't have time to get them quite as clean as we would have liked. Well, I mean, nobody has time to get them quite as clean as one would like. Uh, I think that the Unforeseen relations uh, between uh, places uh, surely in part uh, depend on uh, the dimension of the text window you choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, 500 words, uh, I remember when. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in 500 words, uh, you can have uh, a complete shift of argument. Uh, so that uh, Athens and uh, Corchira could be related uh, only by being in the same block, uh, yeah. but with no other reason. Uh, from a linguistic point of view, uh, 500 words uh, are a quite big chunk of text. Nevertheless, uh, usually these functions, this, uh, the, mm. this approach function, mm. um, the other uh, uh, precaution uh, I think uh, we can uh, we must have uh, is that uh, and uh, 
consider that I'm here because I believe in this approach, but uh, this approach of working with uh, text as data is that from data you can always produce other data, but not always these data are meaningful. This is a, a, a preliminary precaution I think uh, we must uh, have uh, in our mind, otherwise uh, we are completely data driven, but uh, if we work with text, uh, we must be text driven and then we have data as an help uh, to study text. Don't know if I I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite with you. O on the first point, I agree it's yes. totally arbitrary window and it maybe should be, you know, we're trying to make something that will work for yes. a it big range of texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to that's, that would be a good, good card, idea. Uh, yeah. well, on the other point, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understood you, but I'm also not quite sure I agree. My, no, my, my no, background no, is no, language uh, processing. Uh, yeah. about uh, a possible problem uh, yeah, which uh, we, we, we face when we're so um, we unfortunately run out of time, so let's continue it later on. Thank you very much.